Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the Adult Sunday School lesson for July 16th, 2023. We are still in the book of Genesis, this time Genesis chapter 25, a lesson dealing with Jacob and Esau. The unit is entitled Tests, Trials, and Opportunities, and uh, the unit looks at some of the difficulties faced by Abraham and his descendants. We looked at Abraham and Isaac. Last week it was Isaac and Rebekah. This week, Jacob and Esau. Next week, Jacob and the Lord. And then the final lesson in the unit is entitled Jacob and Laban. These lessons deal with questions of trust, prayer, favoritism, fertility, sibling rivalry, scheming, God's intervention and provision. And uh, from these lessons, we discover that God is involved in all of these things. And uh, we are invited to examine how we might be encountering God as we face our own tests, trials, and opportunities. Here is the traditional author or compiler of the book of Genesis. Michelangelo's depiction of Moses. Who knows what Moses really looked like, but in Michelangelo's understanding, he was a powerful, mighty man. The book of Genesis deals with beginnings. The main point is that God created and sustains everything that exists. Though sin damages creation, and God's relationship with humanity, God is still at work in the world, restoring both. So in Genesis, we have the beginning of the universe, the beginnings of humanity, the beginnings of sin, the beginnings of civilization, and the beginnings of the Jewish nation with the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remind ourselves of the family tree of the patriarchs, Abraham had three families, actually. Uh, the first wife that's mentioned in Scripture is Sarah, and he uh, produced a family with Sarah, but he also produced a family with Sarah's handmaiden, uh, a lady named Hagar. Hagar and Abraham begat Ishmael, who begat other sons and daughters that became uh, uh a, uh, a large tribe of, uh, of perhaps Arabians or Muslims, uh, not exactly in the, uh, the, the tribe of Judah, however. The tribe of Judah came about because of Abraham's, Abraham's marriage with Sarah, and they begat Isaac, Isaac took the wife Rebecca that we studied about last week, and together Isaac and Rebecca produced Jacob and Esau. And today we're going to look at uh, the relationship, the strained relationship between Jacob and Esau. Up on that same line with Abraham, you see there's a, a third wife, Keturah. After Sarah died, uh, Abraham took another wife, her name was Keturah, and they begat another tribe of folk. So Abraham really had, uh, had three families. Uh, Jacob, who married Rachel, begat 12 sons who became the, uh, the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, sometimes the name with the 12 tribes are Manasseh and Ephraim, who were actually sons of Joseph, yet, uh, yet they are sometimes named in the uh, hierarchy. So this is the family tree of the patriarchs. And today we're going to be looking at the strained relationship between the sons of Isaac and Rebekah, that being Jacob and Esau. It's not a story of strong morals and an ideal family, but one of conflict sibling rivalry, favoritism, and scheming deceit. 
Genesis 25 tells the complete story of Abraham's third family with Keturah. And uh, we'll mention again that uh, Ishmael was uh, the first son of Abraham, but not through Sarah. But it is through Sarah and Abraham that the Jewish nation came to be. And the third wife, Keturah, they are the uh, forefathers and of the of several Arabian tribes. We get no respect for Isaac. He's like the Rodney Dangerfield of the patriarchs. His story is told mainly in relation to his father being the son of Abraham or through his son, Jacob. So not a lot of fame attaches itself to Isaac. He's kind of like the ghost person in between. But in one way of looking at things, Isaac and Rebekah, some say would be the perfect couple to start the, the, uh, the Jewish tribe. I mentioned in our Sunday school class when we met that uh, Jewish rabbinic teaching has several modes. The written word, the written law, or called the Tanakh, is one way of, of learning about Jewish teaching. Uh, this Genesis through Deuteronomy, the written Torah, the Tanakh, exists in three forms, one being the Hebrew text, sometimes called the Masoretic text. There's a Greek text, a more modern rendition, that was used uh, as the Jewish tribe uh, matured. This is called the Septuagint. It's the Greek Old Testament. But there's also the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered around 1950. And they also contain many stories of the patriarchs. And uh, it's really a third source for the written word. There's also an oral aspect of the teaching that in addition to the written word, these texts would, would uh, spawn many stories and the teachers and rabbis would pass down these stories by word of mouth from generation to, gener to generation, filling in some of the interesting details. And so uh, this is called the Midrash. So there's lots of Midrash associated with the patriarchs, especially Isaac. I'll mention a couple of them in our lesson today. So let's start by looking at the first portion of Scripture, Genesis 25, verses 19 to 23. These verses say, These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah daughter of Bethuel, the Armenian of Padan Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your room, and two peoples born of you shall be divided, and one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. Wow, there's quite a lot of detail in this passage. She had difficulty in conceiving, and of course the, uh, the very sexist writers of the Old Testament attributed any difficulty in, in conceiving as the, the wife's shortcoming or fault. Modern science knows that it's just as likely to be the father that is unable uh, to conceive as, as the female, but the writers make it appear that Rebecca is the one responsible for being barren. Evidently, Isaac had some understanding of his own miraculous conception, so he prayed to God that there would be some miraculous intervention that would uh, help them uh, conceive and start a family. 
Sure enough, Rebecca did become pregnant with twins. And these twins, it, it says, were at war within her. And when, Be when Rebecca inquired of the Lord about why she was having such difficulty, it was made known to her that she was indeed carrying twins. Anytime there are multiple births, it's by definition a dangerous pregnancy uh, likely to end in uh, early birth or miscarriage or other difficulties. But evidently this was a, a violent case of, uh, of, of uh, having lots of difficulty with the pregnancy. Uh, the Midrash teaching on this is that even before they were born, the twins inside Rebecca were fighting it out with each other. Uh, the Midrash says that sometimes Rebecca would go to uh, one place and one of the twins would act up. And then she would go to another place and another twin would act up. And so she really didn't understand what was what was happening in any in any great detail, and it was a cause of concern. I mean, she was so depressed and uh, sick because of this. She even questioned, questioned whether she wanted to uh, continue living. So this fear of miscarriage led to despair and longing for death. So it says she went to inquire of the Lord. And this is strange because there were no priests the, there were no Jewish priests at this time, so the question arises, who did she seek out? Was this a, a Melchizedek still alive? Was there some other priestly clan before, uh, before the Jewish priests came, uh, became dominant? So there are many questions associated with this for which there are some Midrash teachings. Uh, I've just always skipped over it, uh, hadn't thought about it that much, but, you know, the, the priestly tradition within Judaism had not been started by the time she sought out priestly advice for this. Evidently, she did find a priest. There was a priest around who was, who was not a Hebrew that provided some comfort to her. So, there we have a difficult, high-risk pregnancy resulting in twins. But... Mother and father were quite happy to, to, uh, to be parents, and, and uh, their family was indeed starting. So, so then uh, let's read the second uh, portion of Scripture, Genesis 25, 24 to 28 says, When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle. So they named him Esau. Esau evidently means red or ruddy. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Evidently, that means heel grabber or somebody that's contending or uh, it it's, has come to carry with it some connotation of uh, conniving and trickster associated with, with Jacob. It says Isaac was 60 years old when she bore these sons. So they had a, a period of like 20 years that they were married before uh, their family started. The text says that Isaac was 40 when he married Rebecca. It wasn't until 60 that she delivered Jacob and Esau. When the boys grew up, Esau... The firstborn was a skilled hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Wow, we've got the seeds of discontent uh, sown in these few verses. So, When Rebecca gave birth, clearly everyone could see that the, trend, the twins would, was delivered. The firstborn, red and hairy, was Esau. And the secondborn, the heel-grabbing Jacob. And contrast 
between Esau and Jacob are boldly stressed in the in the, not only in these writings but also in the the oral midrash teachings associated with them. It says that Esau was uh, lived out in the wild, was a hunter. He was rather childish in some aspects. He liked to play around, and he was Isaac's favorite. It says uh, because of Esau's skill as a hunter, he would bring in game. And it says that Isaac liked to eat the game that Esau was able to uh, to cut catch. Whereas Jacob is a more subtle, quiet, maybe perhaps introverted person, more like a shepherd. And Jacob became a mama's boy, the the son that Rebecca uh, had a hankering for greater than she had for Esau. So compares and contrasts the ruddy Esau plus the gentle Jacob. They get twins. And their early life, they didn't share many things in common. And who knows, they, they may have gotten along all right or they may have had lots of con conflict the, the written scripture doesn't say much about it. There are other stories in the Midrash, though, that detail some of their uh, uh, pranks with each other. Esau's the hunter. Jacob is the shepherd. This parental favoritism, though, can sometimes uh, work to the disadvantage of family harmony. Isaac preferred Esau and Rebecca preferred Jacob. Naturally, that's that's going to present some resentment if you don't love all your children equally. So let's see how the uh, the tale ends. This is entitled "Dinner and a Birthright," Genesis twenty-five, twenty-nine through thirty-five says. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red stuff, for I'm famished. Therefore, he was called Adam. Jacob said, First, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and little stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Wow, what a strange story this is. The source of the sibling rivalry was, of course, the parental favoritism. And, and each son valued a different lifestyle. In our text, the word for pottage or stew is not in the Hebrew text. It looks like Esau was looking at what Jacob had prepared. And he just says, give me some of that red stuff. Some read this as another of Jacob's tricks. Esau was hoping for a hearty blood stew. Only after eating it did he discover it was merely a vegetable soup. So he didn't get the hearty meal. It was expected, but it was enough to stave off his, his hunger. I can imagine it was something like this. Came in from the field hungry after hunting. Jacob would had a, a meal in preparation. Esau, overcome by hunger, seeks, seeks a dinner. But Jacob is not willing to give him a meal without first Esau forfeiting his birthright. Notice, and the commentators are quick to point this out, the text does not say that Jacob cheated Esau out of his birthright. It says that Esau despised his birthright. Clearly, Jacob got the better end of the deal, but... Uh, 
you know, a birthright with all the material blessings associated with that would have far more value than a bowl of vegetable soup. But Esau, maybe he didn't think through the situation uh, entirely correctly, but he was willing to make that deal. So beware of the deals we make. Esau cared little about the birthright and put no value on God's blessing. You know, he was a, a gruff outside man who cared not for genteel aspects or possessions. So the birthright meant little to him. In the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, if you look up chapter 12, verse 16, calls Esau a profane and irreligious man. And the writer of Hebrews thinks this because he so easily and quickly would give up his birthright. Uh, the commentators say that Jacob is not excused in this unbalanced transaction. You know, Jacob played it out to his advantage, but Esau is more to blame. Uh, the text says that Esau went on his way, satisfied to have sold God's future material blessings, for a bowl of vegetable soup. Imagine that. There it is, my man. Jacob the trickster. Looks like he is pretty uh, smug and pretty happy with the deal he's making. It's a lopsided deal. It's not a win-win situation. It's really I win, you lose to Esau's detriment. So... There's an old proverb about paying too much for a whistle. You know, you, you spend all your money and what you get isn't really worth what you spent. It looks to me like Esau pays too much for a whistle. Uh, a bowl of vegetable soup, that'll be good for a few hours, but God's blessing would last a lifetime. Very unequal trade. But later, we'll see this. Jacob flees for his life in fear of Esau because eventually Esau is going to come to his senses and realize how Jacob has uh, disadvantaged him and this frightens Jacob. Jacob knows that he has done a dirty deed to his brother by exacting such a, a high cost for a mere bowl of soup. What are our issues in this lesson? Well, I think there's a parental lesson here to beware of favoritism. You know, um, I think it's natural that we lean towards maybe one child has talents that the other doesn't, and so we like them for their different abilities. But uh, if we are grossly favoring one sibling over another, that will, will build natural resentment. And we don't want to do that as, as good parents. Also... In our barterings and deals with one another, we should seek a win-win situation, not a win-lose. I mean, we we think that we want to get the, the best end of a transaction, and uh, so that's human nature to do that. But if one party is severely disadvantaged, uh, they will later resent that, and there will be long-term consequences to be paid. But like Esau, we can sometimes place too much importance on transitory, momentary wants to the exclusion of eternal matters. So we can be like Esau many times, trying to just uh, placate our interests in the here and now without considering the long-term aspect of what we're doing. Many of life's problems relate to choosing the better or best options. There are many right answers to life's questions. So we need to pray for a word from the Lord that he guides us in ways that are in our best interest and the interest of others we interact with. And it's never wrong to seek a word from the Lord through prayer and dialogue with trusted friends, pastors, teachers, family members, and others. Uh, we can... I've been benefited greatly from the guidance that I've received when I have uh, uh, been in need of counsel. So there's 
there's good that can come from open and honest sharing with trusted friends. So thank you for joining me today. Remember, please don't take me too seriously. I've given only one interpretation of these verses. There are other ways to look at it. My views reflect a layperson's understanding. And uh, so I urge you to connect with others, another Sunday school class, so that you can have a face-to-face -face conversation about these issues. Remember the prayer concerns of our church. And uh, we'll see you next week for another lesson dealing with the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And again, thank you, Daryl, for putting these sessions together. For your expertise, technical direction, production, and audiovisual support. Thanks again. Till next week, goodbye.